Well, thank you, and thank you very much for having me here. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to be back. I love coming to New Harmony. I rarely get a chance anymore to do that, so I kind of nab at any opportunity that I get to be here. So this is a lot of fun, especially for this topic. So I think, I think we're going to like it. I know I like it. So, <laughs> all right. So the topic of this is digging up uh, the past in southwestern Indiana. Um, but when I was thinking about it, I realized over the course of this past year, I was in the process of analyzing material from our excavations that we did over by the earthwork um, complex, the Harmonist Cemetery that we did in um, 2011. And I thought, well, this is pretty perfect. I, I bet these folks would really like to hear about what's coming up. So that is what I'm going to focus on right now is what I'm finding and uh, any new information that's coming out from that work in 2011. So those excavations, though, were pretty small. So we're not talking about anything grand. And you would have known, right? Because you would have driven by and seen like big stuff, and, and you didn't. So these were really small excavations. We just did a really small, um, like 50 centimeter by four and a half meter trench, really small. And then in another area, we did a small two by two meter area. So we're not talking about a huge thing. We basically did um, five days of testing to see if there was the potential for intact cultural resources. Because there's a lot of historic places around here, right? So there's a, there's a lot of historic places around here. So for the prehistoric stuff, that can sometimes obscure it. So what we wanted to, to know with this really small testing is, is there a, a shot we can find anything um, still intact, still anything there? And we had some pretty good luck. So. Uh, here we go, onward. The, the, the problem with New Harmony um, is that although it's dead center of town and although it's really a prominent part of our landscape here, it's actually really not understood. So if you ask archaeologists, I think you know everybody knows it's Middle Woodland. We have this idea that it's somewhere in the 100 AD, 100 BC era. It's in this um, early woodland, middle woodland time frame. I did a quick Google, and it's kind of all over the boat. We've got 1,000 BC, 500 BC, 200 AD. So it's really not well understood. And, and the reason for that, I think, part of the reason is that we've known for a long time that there's been quite a few excavations taking place early on, because you had a lot of scientists here, too. And where you have scientists, you have digging, because I know that's what I would do if I were here on the boat, uh, boatload of knowledge. So I get that. Um, so we have this nice sprawling landscape. This is the map. Um, this is overlaid on an aerial photograph of New Harmony. And the map you're looking at is, was done by Lesur sometime after 1826. You're going to see a lot of this map. So for right now, you can see that we have this nice sprawling prehistoric um, complex site situated. It takes up, what, about a, a quarter, an eighth of New Harmony. So it is a prominent feature of our landscape here, and we know very little about it. So, so then the question becomes is, is why is that a, a problem? Is that why, you know, what's, what's going on with that? And the reason for that, for, from uh, my perspective, is that as the director of archaeology, as she mentioned, my job really is more in terms of being able to manage the archaeological resources that are both above and below the ground. That means being able to judge what might be there so that when projects have to happen, and this is a great example, it's the 1970, uh, 1977 cemetery wall restoration, D doing a great job of restoring the cemetery wall. So obviously, we want people to come to these sites, and it's bad if these things fall on people and hurt them. So we don't want that. So we need to be prepared um, to be able to do groundwork, do some kind of excavations, um, so that we don't come up with resources by surprise. So it's important to know from a management perspective what we might have, what might be there. And so New Harmony posed a bit of a problem because we just didn't know very much about it. So last, uh, in 2011, we started taking another look at something Bill Wepler had started. And Bill Wepler was a curator uh, of archaeology at the Indiana State Museum. Um, and he started this project. He's been doing a lot of work. He's done work at Dorm 2. He's done work at Fauntleroy, a ton of stuff. In 2007, he started doing remote sensing. Um, using magnetometry. And what that means is basically taking a machine over the ground and it detects anomalies under the ground surface. It's a way to find features, disturbances in the ground that may correlate with you know, archaeological features. So, and it did. What Bill found, and it was pretty quick and easy to see, is that Lesur's map was dead on. I mean, Lesur is Lesur, right? I mean, what are you going to expect? And it did work out that way. He was pretty spot on. On the right-hand side, um, you see those dark spots. 
that correlate really well with what Lesore had done. And you can see that on the left-hand side. And Lesore, when he was here, of course, he did quite a lot of survey work. And you see on this map the nice north-south arrows and things like that. So he's really set himself up nicely, and it worked out. All right, so, so when we started taking a closer look, we started with the man himself, Lesore. And um, since he did that nice map, we thought, well, I bet he's got a lot more information up his sleeve. And he most certainly did. And I, I like to start with this quote from Lesore. And this is both from um, Hammy, I might, I might not be pronouncing this correctly. Anybody can feel free to correct me. But, um, but also the catalogs from the um, Natural History Museum at the Le Havre. We got the catalogs and we started doing translations of those as well. And this quote comes from them. It says, from Lesore, uh, the different tribes of Indians have been gradually ousted, have been renamed, and are intermingled with those in whom they would seek hospitality, not finding those who have invaded their country and who are constantly pushing to enlarge their borders. The civilization will have to make friends, but civilization is still wrapped in his cloak and barbaric people who are covered use it for their own interest in greed. I love this quote from Lesur because this speaks a lot to Lesur as the man and where he's coming from. So we got, from an archeological perspective, we've got two really neat things here. One is he's acknowledging Native Americans built these. And that's pretty outstanding for this time period when many of the folks, including scientists, were thinking that anybody else did the mounds. It certainly wasn't the savage Native Americans that you were seeing. Um, lost tribes of Israel was a big forerunner. The Phoenicians was a forerunner. Pretty much anybody but Native Americans. And here we have Lesore really cutting to the chase. Second is Lesore is coming right out and he's stating, he's stating that um, uh, European expansion is using civilization, quote unquote, civilization as a disguise, as a cloak for expansion and for greed. And I think that's really neat, this early on from Lesore. I like this slide. All right, so based on Lesur, we took another look at his catalogs, and I just have some brief sketches here going on. Um, he itemized each mound. You see they're numbered here, one, two, three, four, five, five, six, and there's a number of ones in there, but he goes through and he lists different uh, characteristics of each one of the mounds. Um, some are more described than others, and I think it's just a question of not finding the right catalog yet. So number one, all I have is it's the primary mound. Hopefully that will be expanded, but right now we have it's the primary mound. Um, slide two. Slide two speaks of uh, the presence of sandstone rocks supporting them had undergone the action of fire, some bones and uh, jaws of a stag, a tin of an antler, um, pine of an antler that had been shaped with a cutting instrument, and lastly, a small blade of darkish flint narrow and curved and sharp as a scalpel on both sides, that's an important one, and, and bone with burned earth. And he states, I believe it indicates a place where we prepare food. So mound number nine, we, or mound number was that, two, we got a lot of information from it in mound two, a lot of burning going on in the Hopewell Middle Woodland world. This is definitely something that we'd see in the terms of um, uh, ritualistic, any uh, ritual behavior, something, a ceremony or something. We see this in terms of Middle Woodland and Hopewell. So this is really interesting. Um, all right, Sl uh, number three, Lesore states, um, that he sees traces of several graves directed from east to west, formed of plates of stone, placed perpendicular and making the walls on each side. The ends were covered by a long stone over six feet wide. The floor was earth, but the top was covered with trays of sandstone. This one's a little funny. The six feet sand, uh, limestone that is really heavy. So it may be that the tomb itself was six feet, six feet by six feet. So it gets a little funny in how he words it. Old French is hard, <laughs> apparently. So I think that one needs a little bit of work. But we'll get back to the tomb. But if you look at number three up there, you can see that Lesur marks it quite differently. He's got slash marks indicating stones, lots of stones. Not one, but a lot of stones. And we'll go back to that one here. On another one, he says, number four contained a burial of unknown type. Uh, and it had been excavated to the ground level. It had, had been surfaced. Number five, he says, was intact, but nothing was found. That's really interesting. Mounds built that have nothing are very well known um, throughout the Midwest. We think of mounds as only being burials. That is not the case. Mounds are really more architectural features on the landscape. People were building them for a reason, and as mounds is just, just one. So there are many instances where mounds are just architectural features. We're not quite sure what they were. 
um, used for, but there's nothing inside them. Um, and uh, number six contained uh, coal, ashes, and pottery debris. And it mentions that Lesor just probed this one. He didn't go into it. So we have a little bit of information, a little bit more information about what's going on. But there's some other things that he mentions that are really interesting. Is First of all, he mentions that harmonists had uh, excavated, or the word vandalism uh, was used. Vandalism, excavated, the word research was used. But now, harmonists, in terms of doing research on burial mounds in a cemetery, seems a little strange. It's something that's hard to kind of get the brain around. So the harmonists had been using the cemetery since they first came, 1814. Uh, they were using that. Uh, it was in a, an orchard. According to tradition, um, they would bury them under, a, an, under an orchard, within an orchard, and not have tombstones. So one kind of wonders about what that might mean and what that might imply by uh, harmonists doing excavations um, on this mound. So, but we'll touch back on that one a little bit. The second thing is that he doesn't mention any excavations by John Beale. Because by uh, 1830, the disseminator quite vividly describes what John Beale had done. And it states, uh, several individuals connected with this establishment, particularly Mr. John Beale, opened one of these mounds and found an arrangement of flat stones enclosing human bones, which crumbled under the touch. A more interesting relic, however, which occurred with them, was a small wooden instrument shaped somewhat like a common retort, but less curved, about four inches long. It had been entirely covered or sheathed with copper, which is now completely oxidized. The included wood is much decayed, but evidently owes its preservation to the protection of the copper sheathing. Arrowhead and knives of flint were also found in the same mound, but the instrument, which may have been used as a knife, requires more observation. It is from one and a half to two and a quarter inches long with two cutting edges. Again, another, we have that, uh, we saw that before. So that's from the disseminator, 625, 1830. Lesur makes no mention. So the thinking is that perhaps this map was done prior to Beale. Um, Lesur probably would have mentioned that um, had he known. So John Beale came, uh, he was the carpenter that came uh, on the philanthropist. So uh, he taught carp carpentry here and excavated, apparently did, did one excavation. I'm not quite sure uh, where he excavated. It doesn't make so much of a, of, a, of a reference to it. There's only one clear stone mound on there, and that's the one that we saw previously. So I'm not quite sure what this one is about. So unfortunately, John Beale's excavation, I don't know anything more about that. But I'm kind of hopeful that it's hiding in here somewhere, because I bet it is. I bet it is, right? He was an Owen guy. I bet it is. So somebody's going to mine and find it. 